I'm really trying to change, but you know what I'm saying? Already, I can't really say for sure, because I might get out, go right straight back to the hustle, you know what I'm saying? I mean, ain't none, ain't none for sure when you get out, man. Ain't none for sure. There's like gangs in here called the HB and felons, you know? They make it real, work real bad for people that's trying, like me, that's trying to really do good with they, something with their life. A landmark class action lawsuit in Ohio has inspired critical changes in their juvenile justice system. What we did find, the lasting impression was the amount of verbal and physical violence that was open and naked. 280 pound officers, you know, face to face, right in front of us. And they knew we were investigating, screaming and yelling. On up. Calling these girls bitches and whores. Think about it. Yeah, because I have a burglary charge. The presence of a culture of violence where you hit first and ask questions later. Now, nobody mounted a sense, but that's what we saw. When they were injured, and we're talking, you know, broken bones and sexually molested. A shoulder broken, a wrist broken. The young girl had been beaten so severely against a wall, she lost hearing. I remember interviewing one kid who had none of his upper teeth. And then when you trace the incident back, in many of these cases, maybe most, no force at all should have been used. It should have been a verbal de-escalation. DYS institutions were wildly overcrowded with kids who never should have been placed there to begin with. Our addiction to incarceration. At that time, the extent they were getting education services, students were getting worksheets passed under the door. We are locking kids down 23 hours a day. I talked to a young man who had been locked down three consecutive months in a special management unit cell that was smaller and less amenable than the Supermax prison for adults. For those kids that are subjected to that, uh, it is absolutely dehumanizing. All these things were noxious and ran counter to any efforts to create an environment where rehabilitation was possible. And we say, well, where's the rehabilitation? How are we trying to change Johnny? Well, we're not trying to change Johnny, we're trying to punish Johnny. But Johnny is an immature, undeveloped kid. Not unlike many other states, conditions reached a tipping point in Ohio's juvenile justice facilities. Kids that had lost vision because of being so seriously injured and having an eye put out. Um, these were very serious situations, and the system needed to start over with a new philosophy. As a result of these findings, the Ohio Department of Youth Services settled a federal class action lawsuit, which became known as the SH case. Both parties, the state and the council, accepted my report as the basis for fashioning an agreement. They concluded, objectively, that the entire system was unconstitutional, that there was cruel and unusual the way the youth were being treated. We locked ourselves up for several months negotiating the way to fix this problem. Came up with the document, which is the settlement agreement in SH. Judge Marbley brought that same expert team in, and Mr. Cohen testified in court, and we brought members of the class, and we described the problem, we described how the uh, settlement agreement solved the problem, and asked the court to approve it uh, for implementation. And Judge Marbley did that. I'm fond of saying that litigation is a clumsy tool, but it may be the only tool we have, realistically. He declared from the bench that this was a, a crisis, that it was a serious problem, and that he wanted it remedied as, as rapidly as possible. So those were our marching orders. This was a system that had been made to look like an adult prison system. Eventually the case was expanded to include all of the facilities because we realized it needed to be overhauled uh, from the top down. The SH case is part of a larger category of judicially stimulated reform, referred to as institutional reform litigation, which leads not to an exchange of money, but to court-ordered, then often court-supervised, change. With the uh, changes that we're trying to implement through SH, Ohio has the opportunity uh, to be a leader. Motivation, you need to get out. There's letters, 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 cards, more cards. Just getting mailed in jail, 
It's like it's like gift for real, cause you get mail in here, it's like like getting money. It's the broad-based reform of internal conditions, making them safe places with the best rehab you can get as we move into the community and establish a whole different identity for this agency. So much of what uh, people focus on, especially when you're learning to be a lawyer, is establishing liability. But the real work is remedy. And you have to get to remedy. You have to work backwards in all your strategizing from where you want this to end up. Our system, this broken system that we talked about, wants to believe that as long as they know the difference between right and wrong, that that's enough. And it really isn't. It begins the discussion. As Ohio moves forward with implementing the changes described in the SH litigation, we spoke with some people who work with the youth in the system about what works best, what a model, effective system looks like. I think what I'd like to focus on is what a good post-dispositional system ought to look like because I think that once kids get committed, it's sort of out of sight, out of mind, and so I don't think we have a good common vision about what the objectives of that system are and what it ought to look like. So I think that there are three things that are really critical. One is that by virtue of the fact that these are kids, they don't lose their constitutional rights, they don't lose their civil liberties, uh, and they should be afforded a good system of legal protections once they're incarcerated and once they're back into the community. But those kids that are incarcerated and out of the community for you know, six months or 12 months or 18 months or three or four years um, are not really on their radar screen. We're always looking for uh, more ways and better ways to uh, be able to represent these youth um, the best way possible. It still strikes me how polite they are um, when we talk to them. I don't know if it's because they know we're there to help them or answer their questions, but they're incredibly polite. They'll accidentally swear and apologize. Um, they'll call call you ma'am or Miss Jill or, um, it, you know, and they're, they're so dear. I mean, they really are. And, and I think there are many times when these kids are portrayed as lost causes or monsters or undeserving of our attention. And, but really, if you go to one of these facilities and you're on unit, what you see is a, a group of kids. Historically, there's been a lot of resistance from allowing youth to have legal representation in any administrative process. We need to make sure that kids' rights are protected when they go to court. They need to be represented by counsel. They need to be afforded due process rights. The juvenile justice system is only gonna work if both sides are represented. Uh, you can't have a strong prosecutor's office and uh, up against a 14-year-old who doesn't understand the court proceedings. It, it, it results in unfairness and it results in bad outcomes for kids. Uh, so kids need strong advocates. There needs to be access to lawyers for conditions of confinement issues. There should also be a built-in judicial oversight piece to that so that a lawyer can bring that case back before a judge for a review. I usually explain to them that they're going to have uh, the opportunity to go to school, that they need to use their time to get as many credits done as they can. Uh, I tell them that I, I read their reports every month, that I look over their case, that I'll continue to look over their case, and if they do well, you know, they'll have the opportunity to write to me and, and get to go home early. If they don't do well, I'm going to know that too. And so those are the kinds of things that lawyers can do. They can also certainly assist in, in securing that child's release and helping with some of the legal barriers that they encounter back in the community on reentry. So it's a great opportunity to be an advocate for a child and to show them that not everyone is sort of out to get them or you know against them or wanting them to fail or giving up on them. In Ohio, right to counsel is something we have focused a great deal of time and energy on. They may feel like they have to waive their counsel because they want to get this over with. And sometimes in an effort to please the court, so to speak, so that maybe the judge will go easier on them. Certainly, uh, the high waiver rate of counsel is something that we've tried to address here in this office. I think a second objective that a good system ought to have is that it looks at keeping kids out of the system that don't need to be there. Research has proven time and time and time again 
that the longer a young person is incarcerated, the less likely that young person will come out of that institution and be a law-abiding, tax-paying citizen. I think the nice part about the university and what I do is that that we're in the field. We're not working in an office, but we're actually trying to, to change young people or change the system to help young people's lives. And so one of the things that I think the, the risk assessment does and the, the new footprint for Ohio really does, either keeps them out and doesn't allow them to penetrate deeper, or also helps them get released quicker. Those kids who really do not need that high end of a resource. I'm encouraged that there is a national dialogue about this, but I really think that we're still reeling from the last two decades of having a get tough approach, uh, toughening sentencing laws, uh, incarcerating more kids, um, basically while crime rates are going down. When I started, we had one juvenile facility, uh, Tico, and there were hardly any kids in it. All the treatment was at the local level, and the juvenile uh, system grew uh, to the point where there were 2,500 kids, which is a lot, uh, just a couple of years ago. The SH case has resulted already in the release of over 1,000 kids, and that's good. When I get home, I know I'm going to be able to use my new thought process because it feels so much better than doing what I used to do, being in trouble. I like, I never got praised, now I get praised, now and it feels so much better. I never, ever, ever want to come back to DYS. I never want to come back to DYS because it's so hard to get out of the system. I would hope that a juvenile justice system that I would design would be built on having these programs available in neighborhoods on the front end, increasing those opportunities for athletics, for art, for extracurricular activities. I think the police could play a big role in the change in the juvenile justice system because we see them first, along with teachers. Teachers see them and we see them. And we can direct them into more productive pursuits. I think it's a mistake to think about working with kids in the community once they're in trouble. I, I, I mean, I'm a true believer that the earlier you can intervene with kids when they're still making good decisions and reinforce those and have positive activities for them to do at a young age, the less likely it is that they're going to be involved in the juvenile system down the road. The more we can do at home, the better off we are. Because as soon as we start doing it in the institutions, we've taken 10 steps backwards. The perfect juvenile justice system uh, would remain separate from the adult criminal system, first and foremost. And I think if there is a third important piece, we need to concentrate on how we get good outcomes for those deep end kids that do need to be incarcerated or do need to be out of the home, and that we are research-based, we are looking at best practices, and that we get away from the idea that we embraced in the 1990s that many states moved toward of simply making this an adult model for teenagers. If we can get them in treatment at an early age, they have a much higher likelihood of benefiting from that treatment and a much lower likelihood of ending up being involved in our system. There's so much stigma even these days attached to mental health, unfortunately, that you know we see a lot of kids that aren't getting the appropriate treatment that they need. It's really important when you consider the fact that most statistics show that somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 75 percent of youth that are in a secure facility do suffer with some kind of mental illness. And so many families see that as being such a stigma for their child. They'd almost rather see their child as a bad child than, than a mentally ill child. And I think there's a lot of resistance to those kind of diagnoses, un unfortunately. You were six years old. Your brother hurt you. How did you feel? You are now 19 years old. You're in treatment and you're doing good. But when you were 17, you heard somebody who was six years old. You heard somebody else that was six years old. Why would you hurt somebody if you were hurt the same way? Every night I wake up and I try to figure out that answer. It gets harder and harder. He's afraid because when he gets out, he's afraid he won't have the support and the help that he needs, which is huge. That's just an enormous step for Daniel to admit that he needs help.